Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so in polarizable media, uh, and, and so you, you generally uh, say uh, something caloric effect, where the something refers to the field you use to order to reduce the entropy of the system. So, magneto, electro, baro, uh, elasto, etc. Okay. Um, what you generally well the, the, the two uh, figure of merit are uh, in adiabatic condition uh, the thermal change the temperature change of the system or in isothermal condition the entropy change of the system okay uh, so this is a long story huh? you have go who, who was uh, reporting about the rubber band experience in early 19th century. Then you have works by Thomson Jowell uh, about uh, properties of solids. And uh, you have here pyroelectric uh, work that is appearing uh, one of the first time. Um, and then you have magnetocaloric effect. So it has been for quite a while, people thought that magnetocaloric effect was first discovered by Warburg. Uh, this is written in many papers still. Uh, actually, recently, some Danish researcher, uh, Anders Meet, wrote a paper. They eventually did read paper by Warburg, discovered that he wasn't at all speaking about magnetocaloric effect. He was speaking about temperature effects due to dissipation, because this is the key of caloric effect. It is a reversible effect. It's not dissipation. Huh? It, uh, potentially, it is a, a reversible effect. So the actual discoverers of magnetocaloric effect are Pierre Weiss and Auguste Picard. Pierre Weiss, everybody knows. Auguste Picard was a, a Swiss physicist and inventor extremely popular in the 20s and 30s of the past century, today forgotten basically, apart for, uh, apart for uh, the character he inspired. So you can say that magnetocaloric effect has been discovered by Trifon Tournesol. Okay. <laughs> so, um, still, uh, Something well, as I told you, uh, adiabatic delta T and uh, uh, is isothermal entropy change are the quantity that matters. So you can classify all the ca caloric materials on the base of the heat they can exchange or of the delta T they can go under application of the field. And here in blue, you see most of the magnetocaloric materials and in green, for, for instance, the uh, electrocaloric one. Uh, something that served maybe a few words is that in principle, in strict sense, so here I'm telling, using magnetocalorics for uh, thermal That is the pyromagnetic effect. Generally, you say something caloric where you change thermal properties through a field, and you say pyro something when you change the properties by changing the temperature of the system. So the, the good term will be pyromagnetic, but for historical reason, nobody calls that materials pyromagnetic materials basically because they have been discovered and aimed for most of the history, uh, thinking in cooling and not in generation, in thermal generation. So we still say, uh, while people in uh, electrocalorics say electrocaloric for uh, cooling and say pyroelectric for uh, generation, here we generate most of the papers uh, 
use the word uh, magnetocaloric for, for everything. Okay. Uh, so the idea is to operate a cycle, a thermomagnetic cycle, to extract work. Uh, here you have a typical Brighton cycle. Uh, you change the field in adiabatic conditions and, and uh, you exchange heat in uh, isofield condition. This is Brighton cycle. And you manage to extract work from that either in mechanical form as it happens with Curie wheel or in di directly in electrical form using uh, uh, flux uh, channeling uh, in, in, in a magnetic circuit uh, that is changing its temperature alternatively. Uh, and you have uh, you have many many devices that have been proposed. Here is Greg Carman from UCLA, one of the first one where you have a vibrating magnetocaloric material. Here is the startup, a Swiss startup with a big Curie wheel, so large scale devices. Uh, here is a medium scale device using Faraday effect from the group of Dresden. Huh? Sebastian Fala. Uh, here is something we developed uh, at SATI, uh, a vibrating system using lanthanum silicon iron. And here is a smaller device using a film, an Oisler or a gadolinium film from the group in uh, Karlsruhe, Manfred Kohl's group. Okay, so you have many, many prototypes at different scales. So some key to understand the potentialities of, of this technology. Well, people were using magnetocalories for cooling. All the focus was on efficiency. When you, you, you say cooling, you say more efficient cooling, that's the key. When you are harvesting waste heat, uh, uh, emphasis uh, switch on power. For many reasons, because you are harvesting to power, power up something, so you have a minimum power that you need to, 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 to have something useful, okay? And for another reason, and it is that uh, in principle, you have uh, waste energy, you have an energy that is cheap and is lost. So it doesn't really matter the efficiency with which you harvest, scavenge that, but it matters to get the power you need. Huh? So the main approach it has been developed to treat this problem was developed in the 50s in relationship to uh, big uh, nuclear um, power stations, because in the 50s, people thought that nuclear energy was an infinite, uh, cheap full uh, amount of energy and so that power was the main issue. Maybe it wasn't exactly true, but with low grade waste heat, you are about in the same situation. You have a huge amount of energy, but very low grade, uh, less than 100 uh, Celsius level uh, that is lost. So with whatever efficiency you want to scavenge that in some, in some way. So the best approach to do that has been developed by Carson and Alborn is known as finite time thermodynamic approach. It's a very simple approach where uh, you basically reduce your engine to a reversible Carnot ideal engine in the middle what people call the reversible compartment, uh, sandwiched between two um, intermittent um, non-equilibrium stationary fluxes of heat. So you basically say, okay, in the middle, I have something that is like a Carnot cycle. I can use Carnot relation between uh, Q and T, T1 and T2, et cetera. But uh, the speed, uh, uh, the time uh, I take to put heat in the system or, or to drag it out from the system depends on the difference between the engine of temperature between the engine and the uh, reservoirs. 
Uh, so here, this is a figure from Cullen. Cullen uh, call the hot and the cold and call uh, uh, the temperature of, of the engine uh, the warm and the tepid. Okay, so you, you, you have these two processes. What, what's the main advantage of this approach? Well, it is quite simple at, at first sight, at least. Uh, it makes a bridge between uh, cyclic engines and the non equilibrium stas stationary state. It, mix, it means that it makes you able to make quite useful uh, comparison with other kind of systems like thermoelectrics that are not cyclic, like, but uh, flux uh, generator. Uh, and uh, um, and in, 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 it allows you to work out uh, a trade-off between power and efficiency that shows you that depending exclusively on the ratio between the tel delta T in the reversible compartment and the delta T between the reservoirs, uh, you can get to a position where you have maximum power and the maximum efficiency allowed to you in such a situation. So you know that uh, here, you have uh, uh, you have no trade-off. You have interest to get there. Then, if you get uh, here, you have to do some choices. Okay, you may have better efficiency, but you're losing in power. Okay. Um, well, still a, a word about about this. Uh, the physics be behind this, that is concealed behind this simple approach, is quite is quite intriguing, and there's a lot of controversy uh, also about. Uh, people worked out the uh, Carson and Albor uh, um, efficiency at maximum power from stochastic thermodynamics calculations. And there's a lot of discussion about the fact that this limit is actually an upper bound, definitely an upper bound, or, or if we can do better than that. So uh, statistical mechanics and stochastic thermodynamics uh, fluctuation theorems uh, are used today to study this limit in small system to understand if it is an absolute limit, like Carnot limit, or no. Okay. Uh, now, let's say, yes, but we told <laughs> that we are reversible inside, but this is true. For instance, mo most of magnetocaloric materials, well, caloric effects are common to all the systems and to all polarizable systems, but they are huge and interesting near on the verge of a ferroic transition. Okay. Uh, if the transition is second order, no problem. But very often, magnetocaloric materials show a transition of a first order with thermal hysteresis. So you risk to have internal dissipation indeed. Huh? Uh, first order transition are very good because you have latent heat that is enhancing the effect, but you, you may be in metastable states and so out of equilibrium. So what about that? Well, let's say that, uh, well, we have many ways to reduce hysteresis even in first order materials by composition, stoichiometry, ion bombardment. So we have today many first order materials to with thin hysteresis. Uh, and from this point of view, what finite time thermodynamics is telling you is, is that in power generation, generally, uh, the amount of entropy production 
during heat exchange is so huge with respect to in the internal production that you in most cases can neglect internal entropy production. But what Carson and Alborn finite time thermodynamics tell you uh, is that power is proportional to the square of the adiabatic temperature change of your uh, fuel, of your active material. So hysteresis, more the, the due to dissipation, can be a real issue if you don't know well hysteresis of the material you're using, if, if you don't know well the working point, say the, the minor cycle where you're working, can reduce drastically your uh, adiabatic delta t. And this can be a real issue because that, that, that is uh, the, the delta t square gives you the power. So that this can be a real issue that must be uh, taken with, with uh, a certain attention. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the main uh, result of, of the carson albor calculation. This was uh, I, uh, what, what I was telling you. Basically, you have a square dependence on adiabatic delta T, and you have interest to work in a system. Uh, the best result is when the uh, engine delta T is uh, one half of the reservoir delta t. That's the situation where you are there, okay? And where this quadratic dependence uh, works. Now, let's go on and see what we did at SATI recently. Apart the other prototype I present you, we decide to go beyond and to try to uh, get small and light and maybe faster. Of course, with respect to the previous presentation, we are bigger and slow. Okay, for us, small and light means something this size, uh, working, vibrating on ten micrometers air gap, and fast uh, means basically one hundred hertz. Okay, this is for us is small and light and fast. Okay, so the idea is, well, uh, we want to be fast, so let, let's try, try to start from a second order material so we don't have hysteresis. Gadolinium is there for that. Uh, we need a membrane, something flexible. Uh, we need to mount that on some sort of spring, and we need to optimize the uh, magnetic stars. So we need some patterned uh, micromagnet, mi micromagnet array to optimize uh, the magnetic field in the device. So this is a result of a collaboration we had uh, in an ANR project uh, recent, recently concluded. Uh, so we have a 17 micrometer freestanding gadolinium film. Uh, we have a micromagnet array producing a, an extremely well confined uh, magnetic field and a magnetic field gradient that is the force that is acting and moving the magnetic material into the system. Um, and we managed to create something that, apart to be small and light and to have some useful power output, must be self oscillating. Say it is autonomous. It means that the magnetic field and some elastic force may solve the work, the work of, on the one hand, triggering the caloric effect. And the, on the other hand, switching a thermal switch, say moving, for instance, the material from the hot to the cold end. Okay, so an autonomous system. So to do that, 
uh, what we did, what, why gadolinium, gadolinium has a quite good uh, adiabatic delta T, uh, it's T, Tc is close to room temperature, and it has a quite wide uh, temperature span for the caloric effect. Huh? The bad issue with gadolinium, everybody knows, uh, it is critical, not in the sense of uh, three points, but in the sense of the cost of gadolinium. So that's a problem, definitely. Uh, nonetheless, uh, energy harvesting with magnetocalorics is something new. Microsystem doing that is something new. And gadolinium has been the reference, the benchmark material for cooling, magnetic cooling, and why not using it as a benchmark, at, at first at least, for this application. Uh, so we took it inspiration from uh, Manfred Cole's group uh, system that was working with, uh, with Oisler, and today he published also something with gadolinium where uh, you have a self-actuated system vibrating on a cantilever. But uh, we would like to have a thermodynamic cycle more ideal huh, than, than the one of, of Carl's group uh, device. So we would like to work on a nearly ideal Brighton, magne mag magnetic Brighton cycle. Uh, so this is the idea of our design. Um, uh, so uh, what, what we did is, uh, well, to produce the gadolinium uh, to remove the substrate, gadolinium in this case is the refrigerant and the heat exchanger. So if you have a substrate, <laughs> half of your thermal effect will be smothered by the substrate. So, so you need a, a freestanding field, okay? Uh, the gadolinium is the refrigerant and what I'm saying is the heat exchanger. So it means that you are not using as in many prototypes, fluid liquid heat exchanger. You are exchanging heat by direct contact of the gadolinium film with the reservoirs. So you need, uh, you need uh, uh, very good surfaces and flexibility also is a quite important point to achieve the good contact, a good uh, surface of contact. Then you need good magnetic properties. This, this we, 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 the main result is here. We got basically, uh, with sputtering a uh, polycrystalline gadolinium thick film, uh, 17 micrometer uh, thickness film with the caloric properties of a uh, bulk single crystal. This wasn't so easy, uh, but we got it. And this, this is pretty, uh, a pretty relevant result. Uh, we, we, we removed the, the substrate um, we managed to have a smooth surface on both sides. Uh, and then we tortured the, the sample as uh, Matthias did. We have also our uh, confessor die device to strain samples. And uh, Gadolinium confessed before dying that it, it, it can, its magnetic properties are pretty stable under strain. So that was a, quite a, a good news. Uh, and then, well, you say, okay, so we get this, uh, we, we, we put in, we, we assemble the system, we, we have working points between 30 and 100 hertz. That means that we have an energy available that is of the order of 100 of milliwatts per square centimeter. 
means that our system this is about one square centimeters it could in principle working on 20 uh, degrees so on a quite thin temperature gradient produce a lot of energy but uh, but what you get eventually using piezoelectric transducer is some three order of magnitude less you you get some 10 microwatt uh, power out why this well this is, is anyway a good result i mean standard implants wireless wireless sensors small autonomous system in um, iot applications needs tens of microwatts generally so that, that's a good result but anyway we, we, we can do better why that well because we are not really at maximum power uh, because there's another trade-off that is the trade-off between the elastic force of the device and the magnetic force at different temperature that is something that is due to ma the magnetic gradient of the magnets and to the temperature of the sample of the gadolinium huh? so this balance between these two forces is what uh, is what get in the good condition the self oscillation and the be stable self oscillation that is what we need but to to get there at the present moment we had to <laughs> to work uh, a little apart from uh, the maximum power and that's why of that result uh, and probably piezoelectric conversion also is not the best solution. Maybe that micro coils in the future would be some, something we have to, to introduce. But yet it moves, okay? And it moves, uh, this is, uh, and it moves uh, in a be stable, good be stable way. So we are actually on the Brighton cycle. We were were uh, aiming and uh, and that is, for the moment is a, a quite good result it is definitely the smallest uh, energy harvester working on such a small delta t uh, available today so uh, in publication of course <laughs> oh. I, I, I think it will. No, I don't want to. No, if you want, I, if you want, I can. Always uh, Yes, but we. Uh, yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. We, we maybe maybe people have questions. Thank you very much. That is an extremely interesting system, which would have been much more interesting if you would tell us about the limits, uh, the frequency limits. Would it work when you scale down the system to the nanoscale? Would it work up to terahertz frequencies or whatever? Yeah? Well, uh, to scale down to the nanoscale, uh, will be quite interesting. I'm not sure we are able, from the mechanical point of view, to achieve that today. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert of nanofabrication. Uh, also, the thickness of the film is an issue. If you have a too thin film, you risk to lose the, the magnetocaloric properties. So, so I, answering on terahertz frequency, uh, I'm not able to answer to this. 
uh, what's sure is that uh, here we can uh, a bit scale down still on the size, but what really matters is to recover, better recover the potential, uh, the energy we, we have available there. Uh, and uh, to use this kind of system uh, for, uh, well, it could be also something recovering, for instance, uh, I don't know, recovering heat from a processor of a PC, but it can be, it has all the characteristic also to be a wearable uh, device. You may figure it to have something as a patch, the hot end is in contact with your skin, and the other end in in a, in a winter uh, situation or polar situation will be uh, will do the the part of the head sink, and so you can use this to to power up uh, small uh, sensors, small devices, small portable devices in. Uh, in a uh, situation like winter situation, for example. This is one of the applications. But for that, you don't need to. At this moment, getting to terahertz would be interesting in principle, but uh, we have enough power and energy there if we manage to scavenge it properly uh, without going up in. In frequency, for example. Yeah, there's a question from Martin. Yeah, thank you for the talk, uh, Martino. My question is as follows: um, In this cycle, um, the can you benefit uh, and achieve uh, additional conditions for self-oscillation and basically autonomy by uh, using? magnetic electrodes that are your hot and cold sources near a phase transition and basically uh, use enhanced entropy production rate, not only using your uh, cantilever, but also the electrodes that uh, are in contact with the cantilever in order to, uh, in order to yeah, obtain a feedback, a feedback mechanism. You say ma ma magnetic electrons. You say uh, in the in the magnet in the material or in your hot and cold sources. I must say that uh, <laughs> this, in principle, will be possible, and I think will be uh, if. We manage to scale down such uh, a technology that will be probably a, a, a possible way to enhance properties. Let's say that if we scale down, uh, as uh, uh, they asked me, uh, you will surely have less magnetocaloric effect from the uh, magnetic material. So we'll, you will have to search some additional help from around. So that could be a solution, but uh, I can tell you much more than that. Let's say, <laughs> okay. I guess my 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 comment is that uh, if you have a hot or cold reservoir near a phase transition, and that phase transition is affected by the proximity or the uh, moving away of additional ma magnetic material on your cantilever then you can enter feedback regimes that could be interesting. It, it, it looks a bit like uh, the sort of effects that uh, we observe or think we observe when we study quantum spintronic engines. Yeah, so you say it's somewhat to have some reservoirs that are not ideal, that are changing their properties with the feedback uh, to the active part. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's to have actually active reservoirs and some, some, somewhat is, this is the idea. Yeah, I said, is, I, you get into the concepts of so-called ergotropy. We can talk uh, about it uh, later sorry? if you wish. We get into concepts called ergotropy uh, where uh, feedback mechanisms lead to additional sources of work for the engine. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay, ah, so one, one more question. Uh, sorry, I think there are some time I, I might lose for this slide about TMG device. So if I mean it's, um, it's like the change of the temperature caused the change of the magnetic moment. So as the effect is a mild restriction generated and applied to the piezoelectric. Yeah, you have just, you have a magnetic field from the array of micromagnets and you have gadolinium that is changing his magnetic state from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic and vice versa. Uh, and so that change that triggers the caloric effect, of course, that means that during the field change, gadolinium changes its temperature because this happened when, when, when it is moving and it is moving fast enough, even if it is in air to consider that, that change adiabatic. But in the same time, magnetization of gadolinium is changing. That means that you have a magnetic moment in a field gradient. And so you have a change in the magnetic force, okay, depending on the position, and on the temperature of the sample. So this black line is the elastic force as a function of the position. This is the gap, okay? Here you have micrometer. We are oscillating over 40 micrometer. Huh? So here you have elastic force and these lines are the magnetic force as a function of the position and of the temperature of the sample. So you understand that the point of inversion of your oscillation are the point where the magnetic force line cross the um, elastic force line, okay? So the, e, 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 the best, now uh, this was another presentation I had, but I, I, I focused much on uh, finite time thermodynamics. Uh, the point is to oscillate on something that is here uh, like that. You go on one of the, you go on one of these lines till the hot end. Then you are at, at the hot end. So your magnetization is going down because you are losing magnetization till, till becoming paramagnetic. And so you goes down here. When you get there and you get below that line, the magnet, the, the springs move the, the gadolinium away here. When you get there, you are on the cold side. So you become again ferromagnetic. So you go there and No, the power out of you, you estimate from basically, well, our, um, uh, our uh, prototype has been designed also as a test bench. So you may measure the kinetic energy uh, of your oscillation and that's, uh, that's the energy you have available. Then the problem is that you dissipate, for instance, a lot of energy in the collision with the bus, for instance, it, 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 it's, uh, there's a noise when it works, you have a like that. Uh, this is a lot of energy <laughs> you are losing <laughs> and you are not recovering, for instance, okay? So there's many, many issues that uh, can improve. 